about uh, what is the application and so on. Um, so we will handle, we will give the mechanical and electrical uh, control design examples in this um, course. And we said uh, the first step is doing the modeling. And by modeling, we meant that we want to come up with uh, a set of equations, differential equations, which are described in the model that we have. So what we want to do is we want to talk about the system modeling uh, in time domain because you might know that we can represent everything in, let's say, uh, frequency domain. Or another domain that we have. So the question is that how we want to define the model. So let's uh, write down a few definitions. So we use the term model to refer to a set of mathematical equations. We know that we mean differential equations. Uh, used to represent a physical system relating <coughs> the system's output signal to the input signal. What does it mean <coughs> relating the, the output signal into the input signal? Hmm? Can you can you give me a, a paraphrase, a synonym for this sentence? Relating the system's output signal to its input signal. In other words, what is the ultimate aim in modeling boson? I mean, we do a modeling and we come with this differential equation. Find the relation, like when you give some input, you want to see how the output will be. We want to predict the output. We want to see that if we give some input, we want to predict what is the output. Today, we do a very simple examples of, of models and we see that, okay, for some input we have, uh, we can predict some output and theoretically it's a mathematical equation. You can give any input into your equation and get any output. But then we come to, to the facts that in the reality we, this doesn't work. You cannot give input in infinity as an input because we don't have infinity as an input. So we talk about these things. So uh, we, we write relating the system's uh, um, output uh, um, uh, to, to its input, but you can read it as predicting what is the output if the input is um, given. So in general, when we are referring to the modeling, we are talking about two requirements. So a model is required in order to one to understand system behavior to to design a control now understand the system behavior uh, means in order to analyze um, the, the analysis of, of, of the system. For instance, uh, we use the model in order to see if the system is, let's say, linear. The system is uh, time invariant. Uh, well, the system is stable. The system is with memory or without memory. So we use uh, this analysis, we use this model in order to come to, to, to some analysis. And design a control uh, means that uh, we synthesize we, we, we synthesize. Now 
you have, we have to keep something in our mind that without a controller, without a controller, we don't have any taste of uh, what is the desired output and so on. In other words, for the system, you give an input and you get an output, right? And we design, we synthesize a model, we design a controller which goes to the output, sample the output, and by some mechanism, which we know that is uh, either subtractor or, or, or competitor, we, we compare whether this is what we wanted to have or not. And then accordingly, we do some other um, operations. So we get, we get some, some feedback. So these two steps, analysis and, and the synthesis is, is very important. So it is necessarily, it is necessary to understand how the system works naturally in order to know how to be able to change how it works using a feedback. In other um, maybe I, I give you this, this example. You know the cruise control example that we saw before? Uh, we said that uh, the turtle that we have, the angle the, the, of the, the pedal, the, the accelerator, uh, can result into different speed, right? So we have to know how the system, how the car works first. And if we know that one, then we can come up with some, some feedback system, which, we, um, I don't know, we had this the tachometer, which was getting the speed, and then we were comparing it with what is desired. And then after that, we had uh, another system, which tells us, okay, we have to, uh, the system should put, let's say, uh, do more combustion, because we need to increase the speed. But in order to come to this red part, we need to first be able to model the system. We need to know that how the system works, because if I don't know how it works, I cannot calculate what should be the input because I don't know what is the output for that specific input, right? So this is why this analysis is playing a very important role. This is why we will talk about analysis today. We spent a whole lecture about uh, this analysis of the system. So, developing uh, Reasonable mathematical model is the most important part of the whole. So, mathematical model, we mean this differential equation, partial differential equation that we have. Why, Martin, we use the word reasonable? As well as possible. Uh, that is why we use the word reasonable, because if we want to have it as well as it is possible, it is not reasonable. Because if you want to have it as well as possible, uh, I mean, he had the point, as, if you want to have it as well as possible, it means that we have a very complicated differential equation with a very high order but it is very accurate, like, like zero error. However, it's not reasonable because in order to build a controller for that, you have to spend a 
huge money. And then uh, you, the, car, the cruise controller, instead of let's say being uh, uh, 10,000 euro, will become 20,000 euro because the cruise control is just simply so accurate. It's very, very accurate. We don't want it very, very accurate. We want to have it uh, reasonably okay. In other words, if you set up the speed, let's say for 100 km per hour, uh, no one will kill you or you won't be unhappy if it's 101 actually in the reality or if it is in the reality 99, right? But it will be much cheaper if we define that little bit of error. So that's why that we use the reasonable, uh, the, the, the adjective reasonable in here. It is actually a very complicated tasks. I mean, I gave you lots of examples. Do you remember I showed you the dog? I showed you even the bird, and I said that this is that we haven't, we don't have it. In other words, in a control uh, uh, design of a controller, eighty to ninety percentage of the uh, effort will go to develop a mathematical model. The rest is very easy. I mean, you are very good in electronics, so I, if I give you all the circuitry, you can just build it. It's a matter of like soldering or choosing the more appropriate device. The question is that whether you need a capacitor, whether you need an inductor, whether you need a series of them and how you have to connect it is something that the mathematical model will tell you. So coming to this point is actually getting the maximum amount of effort. So there are two approaches for making a model. If I write here, can you record it? Yeah. The first one is called analytic system modeling. The second one is empirical system identification. So there are two approaches. One of them is analytical system modeling, which means we come up with, uh, let's say, second order differential equation, first order differential equation. I, I solve three or four examples in the lecture one on the board, and we come up with some, some differential equation. It's, it's analytical uh, system modeling. This is our focus in this course. Now, the uh, empirical uh, system identification, what happens here? we come up with uh, sets of generic differential equations and then we try to fit our problem into, into these ones or we try to approximate it or we try to come somehow change the problem or, or reform the problem that we come into here and we say that for these sets of equations we have this solution so we know it. Care fitting is, is one of the way we usually use in here. In the care fitting uh, what you do is you give some sets of data and you say that for this set of data we have this curve and you know how the curve works because you have, you have the equation of this curve but here as I said in this course we are dealing with this outcome uh, system Is accurate, no system is, uh, is exact, and we have some sources of inaccuracy. 
And these uh, sources, I mean, we, in general, we have two, two, two reasons. The first, uh, let me write them and then we describe, is unknown parameter values. And the second is on model dynamics. On model dynamics. So there are two reasons for uh, not being accurate. And one is unknown parameter values. We, we saw an example and we said that f is equal to ma, right? This is a very simple model. But we do not know what is, let's say, the mass of the object that we have. Right? The mass can change due to uh, time. Maybe it, it's, a, it's a racket and it goes, and as it goes, we lose the fuel, so the, the, the weight is changing. And there are, maybe you said, okay, I can always calculate how the weight changes, which is very correct, then we will come to this point. Reasonable mathematical model. It will become more complicated. So what happens is that we, we, we understand, okay, it will be reasonably okay, we assume the mass is not changing, or the mass is changing linearly, but maybe it's not linear, and we understand that then we have some inaccuracy, but we will handle that inaccuracy. The other one is unmodeled dynamics. Our model dynamics means this. Uh, we want to have reasonably mathemat uh, math simple mathematical model, right? It means that on purpose, we start not to model some part of the dynamics. I give you two examples. One of the examples is for high school. The other example is something that we do in university. The high school one is, uh, we say that this is the car that you have on the surface, and you apply this force and it goes, calculate, let's say, the accelerator. And we had a big assumption. What was that assumption? I don't know the English, but I... What's the Turkish word? Uh, yes, we don't have the friction. We don't have the friction. We assume there is, there is no friction in here, okay? So, friction means unmodeled dynamic. Why we don't assume that we have friction? Because for high school kids, it's simple. So they can only use a few few formulas. Now, in the, in the reality, what happens is this. We know that the Newton law fails when when the Newton laws fail, do you know? Outside of the space. I no, what, uh, very close, but why, uh, under which condition the Newton laws fail? Who is the opposite of Newton? Come on. He's very famous. <laughs> He's one of the most famous scientists in the world. Einstein. Einstein. So what was what was the difference between Newton and Einstein? Time can be changed. No. Relativity. Relativity. Uh, closer, closer, closer. What was the thing when the V goes to C? Einstein was very fast. And it was talking about the speed is the speed of, of the light. So when we have the speed of the light, do you know what is changing? The mass is changing, right? M is equal to M0 divided by S square root of 1 minus V square over C square. So mass is changing. So the Newton law space. Basically, the Newton laws always space. The Newton laws is not correct. It's an approximation. So Newton law space when V goes uh, towards the C. Because the formula, for example, for mass was something like, like this. Uh, however, with our daily life speed, imagine you have the Bugatti Veyron and you can go maximum with you know, 360, 370 kilometers per hour. And still, with that speed, we are very well okay with Newton. In other words, the model, the simplified model that we have is very well okay for all our calculations. 
So we have an unmodeled dynamics because we want to have reasonable mathematical model. Uh, we are all right, but we understand that this is not 100% exact and accurate, and this is one of the sources of this inaccuracy. So let's. Where is the eraser? No friction, right? Friction, never forget that. So let's do a few examples. A few examples where we want to see this reasonable mathematical model. We want to see uh, these unknown parameters. We don't talk about the unmodeled dynamics because we, uh, in the examples that I have, we don't have them. So let's say example. And the example is consider a 1 O. 2 watt resistor I know it's a very complicated example but I hope you you can cope with it so you see a power supply Cable and resistor. What is the first formula that comes in your mind? Ohm's law. We call it law, but it is actually Ohm model. State that the ratio of the voltage over the current is constant. In other words, uh, Vt is equal to R I T. Right? So we have we have some number and it is apply one volt. Okay? Apply one one volt. What happens? Tell me what happens. Abdul Aziz will tell us what happens. We have this very complicated circuit in front of us. And we apply one volt. You tell me what happens. You need a pen and paper? Uh, I want to get. Uh and what happens means that tell you all the unknowns. I tell you what is V, I give you what is R, you have to calculate what is I. And he will do it. He said. What is I? Don't worry. Okay, he gave me V. I gave you V, one volt. Koishen gave you the resistor 1 ohm. Uh -huh. And I'm asking you, what is V? What is I? I think it would be P all over V. P over V. Okay. So now you have to calculate P and I. BP. Okay, well, what if we use Ohm's model? We have this model, V is equal to Ri. What is V? One volt. One volt. What is R? One ohm. One O. What is I? One. Why? Why is it one? Because the Because the I is V divided by R, right? Uh -huh. From this equation. V is 1, R is 1, so the result is 1 ampere. 
okay? Uh, have you heard of Ohmsdorf? Uh -huh. Okay, good. <laughs> now, Martin will tell me more complicated answer, and uh, he tells me what is the power which is dissipated inside this resistor. With this condition, it's one, it's uh, one watt. One watt, and uh, because power is, let's say, v square divided by r, it is v r. It is i square r. By any means that you want to calculate, we will get one. What is the unit? What? What? So we get, we get, we get one watt. So uh, what can we say about the accuracy of the model? Uh, it should be accurate, right? Uh, I, I don't talk about that. Okay, the ampere meter or the volt meter might not be accurate, and might be it's it's not really one volt. But assuming that they are accurate, it, it's very very okay. Now, uh, Ozan did, did tell me now. I apply 10 volts, okay? And I want you to tell me that what happens. And by what, what happens, I mean that, uh, uh, tell me what is I and what is P. Uh, I use the 10 upper. Okay, I is V divided by R. I said I, I, um, this is 10. Is, is, is 10 ampere and P is also 10 watt, but the resistor is uh, can handle 2 watt maximum. It's 10 squared divided by 1, so it is 100 watts. Uh, and he has the point. Uh, Model tells me. What Ohm's model tells me that P is 100 watt. However, we know that it's a resistor with the 2 watt. So what happens? What happens? Fire. Well, uh, not fire, but the circuit will, this circuit, you know, it turns into a new element. What is the name of that element? Like smoke. No. Short term. Yeah. And what is the technical word for that? It's a fuse now. It poof, burns. Okay, so it turns into the uh, uh, fuse or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so now, can you tell me about the accuracy of the model now? Very inaccurate. It's not accurate at all because the model tells me hundred watts. Whereas we understand, it turns into the short circuit. It turns into fuse. It it, it burns. It it, it destroys. So it, 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 you will never see the 100 watt. So this means that this is not a very, very uh, realistic model that we have in our, in our hand. What we, and uh, what Ohm's law was, uh, and what Ohm's model was basically say was this. Uh, do you know what is the actual definition of this Ohm's law? What, what did he say? Ohm's, Ohm said the ratio of voltage over current is constant is that V divided by R is constant value which we call it the, the resistivity and we know that this is not correct but correct is a very strong word this is not accurate because the relationship between the input and the output 
is not linear is nonlinear. In the reality, this is the case. Nothing is linear. We have all the things which are nonlinear. So this is the real cases. But nonlinear differential equation already are, are not easy. And now you are talking about being nonlinear, then it will be even more complicated. So what we do, so why do we talk about the linearity at all? Because we can approximate our nonlinear systems with the linear systems. You can draw a circle with infinitely many straight lines, right? So this is the reason that we say, okay, we accept inaccuracy because it will be much simpler to build and to handle. So I write a very important conclusion. However, we can approximate our systems oh, which is nonlinear with linear representation. So V divided by I up to that this is constant. This is what Ohm said. Ohm said, ah, I measure uh, v, i, and I got this line. So it is linear. But in the reality, we know that this line is actually this. Right? Because after some time, it, it burns. You cannot, you cannot continue. We cannot get this 100 volt out of it. Now, so question is that what do we want to talk about? in this course is this. So we are dealing with the systems and in this course we want to focus on LTI systems. So let's see what are the LTI systems. Do you know what is the LTI means? You had it in, in digital signal processing course. If you were in University of Tartu, otherwise you have seen it in, in signal and system courses. Suman? Uh, linear time invariant. Linear time invariant. It means it's linear. Uh, TI means time invariant. Now, in general, for a system, we have six properties. And two of these properties are linearity and time invariant. So what we want to do is, uh, we quickly, I write them what are they, and I quickly tell you what are the definitions. And we spend a bit more time to talk about what a system is linear, what a system is time invariant, and we try to, to draw a block diagram for them to see and understand the model. Why are they very important? Because we want to handle uh, systems which are time invariant. Why the time invariant one, LTI systems, linear time invariant one are important? Because then I can use, let's say, the, the frequency response, or I can use the impulse response in order to characterize my system. If I know the, uh, the, the impulse response, then it means I can model the whole system with the differential equations. Now we will talk about the frequency response. We, we use the um, Laplacian in order to represent it. And then we see that easily from that, I can come back and draw the differential equation of the system. So let's talk about the six important property of the system. Properties of the system. Do you remember them? What was the first one? I have, have you seen them? Okay. Uh, there are six properties in the system. First one is called memory. I, I'm 
define them in a, in, a, in a minute, but let's write them down. The second one is called invertible. Third one is called causality. Fourth one is called stability. Fifth one is linearity. And sixth one is time invariant. So, and, and I put a star because when we talk about uh, the representation, it's very important to, to know these things. A memory, uh, what is, forget about the system, and tell me what is memory? You know that there is an illness called Alzheimer, and the person who has Alzheimer, they say that that person has no memory. What does it mean that someone has no memory? Don't remember what? The past. They don't remember the past. So they live for the present. So memory means that I have an understanding of what is happening not at the present. And usually we mean something happened in the past, but for the system, uh, we can have memory if I know some information about the future. In other words, I cannot give you an output only based on the current value. I look at all old and all the surroundings like the bank. You go to the bank, uh, before they give you the credit, they look at your, your credit history. And they say, oh, no, you are not a good, 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 good person to do your credit, right? So the same thing is valid for a system. If the system, in a system, the output depends at the input on the present only, we call it a memoryless. In other words, the output at time t is equal to 10 depends on the input only at time 10, we call it memoryless. But if the output at time 10 depends on the input at any time, apart from ten, time uh, 10, then we call it a system with memory. Okay? Um, uh, you know that one of the operators that we have in, in many control uh, uh, in, in many controller is the integrator. Integrator is it a memory or a memoryless device uh, uh, system? It's a memory because you we integrate from minus infinity to, to this time. In other words, I'm adding up all the previous values. Maybe those values are zero, but I'm adding them up because I memorized that it was zero. Invertible. What is invertible? Uh, let's let's get back to calculus one in undergraduate. When a function is invertible, what under what condition do I have an inverse of a function? What is a special case about, or what was the condition that we could have in order to have an invertible uh, function? We said a function is invertible, we had it in the linear algebra, it's invertible if it is one-to-one. -one. Now, what is the meaning of one-to-one? -one? It means that for a unique output, I have a unique input, or for a unique input, I have a unique output. In other words, if I give uh, the function uh, value y zero, uh, a value it's zero, I will get the value y zero. And if I give you the y zero, there is only x zero which is producing that one. As an example of a system which is not invertible, we can refer to the system y t is equal to x t squared, x squared t, right? This function you may remember y t is equal to x squared t. Now, if the input is 1, what is the output? 1. If the input is minus 1, what is the output? 1. Now, I give you that the output is 1. What is the input? We don't know. It can be 1, it can be minus 1. Another famous non-invertible is let's say for a discrete one minus one the y n is equal to five for any input i have only one output which is five so if i give you the output is five sum on what is the input you don't know so it means that it is not invertible 
So in order to be invertible, we have to be one to one. Uh, one distinct output has one distinct input. The third one is causality. Do you know what is causality? Any system that we have in the real life is a causal system. If the system is not causal, you don't have it in the market. We don't, we don't, we don't have it. So what is this causality? Apologies and so on. You are all electrical electronic engineer, right? Causality means that the output at time t depends on input at time t and or on the previous values of t, uh, xt. In other words, I depends on present and the past. Or I can say that I depend on the present or past. Or I depend on present plus some values of the past. What is for sure is I do not depend on the future. So a causal system does not depend on the future. Now why do I tell you that all the real-time system, all the system by real-time, I mean all the system that we have in the world are causal Why you don't have a non-causal system? Because of analog. Hmm? Because of analog system. Like no. Of time. It needs some input which is not yet here. But yes, a, a non-causal system means that I have to deal with the output which uh, with the input which has not happened yet. I don't have it, so I cannot build it up. So in other words, uh, except on the paper and examples, you don't have a, a non-causal system. Now, we have talked about these uh, uh, three properties here. Can you, before I give you an example of causal and non-causal systems, can you tell me a general example which is definitely causal? Can we say that if a system is invertible, it is causal? Stop the video.